Silvius Traders Lounge in partnership with Scope Markets welcome you to yet another webinar where we learn, trade and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management and trading psychology. Today's guest is John Locke and our theme is how traders can make sound and great decision making processes. To have you all, John Locke's Trading Bio. Since establishing Locke in Your Success LLC in 2006, John Locke has emerged as a leader in the trading industry. He has authored more than a dozen options trading strategy courses and created many career changing trading performance programs, which are used by traders around the globe. To support his students, a trading community was developed where hundreds of talented traders share ideas, have access to educational resources, attend live and recorded webinars. John is a professional trader on SMB Capital's Option Trading Desk and is a regular presenter on their podcast on the Options Tribe. In his pursuit to become an expert in the study of human behavior and trading performance, John has achieved multiple master certifications in transformational coaching, neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis, and is deeply involved in many other self-improvement sciences. He uses these skills to help traders conquer fears, overcome anxiety, and break through the barriers holding them back from performing their best. So John, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for having me on. And maybe you can start off by briefly explaining to us about your trading journey, how you started, why you're passionate about human behavior and trading performance, as well as define for us what metrics you look for when traders want to make sound decision-making processes. Okay, yeah, so those are, that's a, a great question. Uh, I started becoming interested in human behavior and performance long before I knew anything about trading. So that's always been a passion for me. And um, in fact, I was a success coach before I learned how to trade. And as a success coach, I ended up going to a lot of success seminars. I come across a, uh, a seminar where they were doing a presentation on trading. And I decided to go ahead and get involved with it. I, th I really love the concept of trading and so forth. And I think I started out trading like a lot of people where um, I came in, it looked fantastic. It looked fairly simple and easy to do. And I went in and, and, and I started taking these courses and I spent all, I mean, I really dove into it. I, I spent all kinds of money and I learned a whole bunch of different trading strategies and all kinds of things about the market. And I did that for years. And I think like a lot of people, I was kind of looking for the magic formula where we could simply follow instructions and do the same thing every single time and consistently make money. Now, when I did it, I did it on a monumental scale because I spent most of my life savings, right? I was, I was so passionate about it. I spent most of my life savings going in and doing these things. But, you know, after about two years, when I was trading, I found that I learned an awful lot of information and I knew an awful lot about the market. I followed a lot of people, but I still wasn't getting any results. And, you know, I was really, really frustrated um, with my progress. And I got to the point where I spent so much money and I spent so much time, I put so much work into it. I said, forget it. I'm done. I'm not trading anymore. This, this, this stuff doesn't work and it doesn't happen. So I literally quit trading. But at some point, maybe two or three weeks later, I went back and I, I took a look at what I was thinking and I said, well, well, I know there are some people making money in the stock market. Why am I not making money in the stock market? You know, and that's when it hit me. That's when I, when I said, well, wait a minute. There's, there's reasons that people perform well in any, um, in any environment. And, and I know this stuff because I've been training in this stuff for a really long time. So what I did is I, I essentially took what I knew about trading. I applied the psych, so the psychological skills that I know how to do. And we applied that to trading. And then, the, I mean, within three to six months, I mean, things just took off and everything changed for me. Um, uh, so that is the reason that I like that. Now, um, 
and that's what right. that okay yeah and uh, what was your other question i'm trying to remember um right. oh where, where the uh, okay what metrics you look for when traders want to make good decision making processes okay right so when we look at traders we find that they, the, the, and we take and we study the traders that do really, really well in the market. They have a lot of things in common, but there's one thing that they don't have in common. And that thing that they don't have in common is the strategy that they use. The thing that they do have in common is the way they make decisions and the way they think about their thought processes around trading. And that is the key, is having the right thought processes. And we'll talk about that as we get into the presentation. All right, cool. So maybe you can elaborate to us about your risk management and money management and why that is important for traders and also how you normally teach your students on position sizing. So how do you factor in the correct and calculated risks at SMB Capital? Right. So position sizing is going to be an extremely important topic, not just financially, because if your position size too large, you can obviously lose too much money, but also from a psychological perspective. In order to trade well, you have to have the proper mindset. And if you get into the point where you're trading so large that you're fearful and you get overly concerned about the results of a particular trade, then that's going to hurt your trading. So that's an extremely important, important topic. Realize that proper position sizing has nothing to do with the size of your account. It has nothing to do necessarily with how much money that you have. And it does certainly doesn't have it. It certainly doesn't have anything to do with how much money you want to make. And that's what a lot of people do. They say, I have this much money and I want to make this much money. So I'm going to position size this size. But the reality is position sizing is all about how much you're freely willing to lose. So the short answer is we always want a position size based on the amount we're freely, we are freely willing to lose. The long answer is proper position size for an individual is going to vary greatly depending on their current situation, their goals, and the type of trading that they do. Now, when I coach clients on the topic, we're going to look at things such as their net worth, the type of assets that make up that net worth. In other words, is it all in cash? Is it in real estate? How is it compiled? What are your financial obligations? What's your experience in trading? Um, your psychological tendencies, risk tolerance, risk capacity, um, all those types of things. We're gonna take that, we're gonna bring them together. And then at that point, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the optimal position size for a client. As far as the trade desk goes, it's almost the same thing. I'm allowed as a trader on the trade desk, I'm allowed to have a certain amount of capital and I can use that capital as much of it or as little of it as I want. And I can trade pretty much however I want. However, there's a very defined limit on how much I'm able to lose in a certain time period. And let me tell you how important that loss limit is. Now, I'm the senior trader, and I'm the senior trader, which is means I've been the trader, the, the longest standing trader on the SMB desk. That was their very first trader when they opened up, and I'm still there. I've seen a lot of traders come and go. And when we look at SMB capital and the way they treat the traders, a trader can screw up. He can make bad trades. He can lose money repeatedly for periods of time. He can do all sorts of crazy things. And, you know, a lot of times if, if a trader is going through a bad period, you know, SMB will come in and they say, well, we understand you're going through a bad period. How can we help you out? That's what they'll do. But the one thing that'll get you fire off that desk instantly is going over your loss limit. There's, there's no excuse for that. That's how important, you know, they see, you know, a, a hedge fund, sees your loss limits. That's how important they are and that's how important they should be for you also. Set a responsible loss limit, stay within that number always, no matter what. All right, John. You have an options tribe and just to mention briefly, given your trading experience at SMB Capital, maybe you can tell us, um, given your extensive research and work experience, how do you define the difference between call and puts, bids and ask prices 
to a novice uh, retail currency trader? Because we normally mostly have an audience of Forex traders. Right, so uh, <clears throat> options are, they, they, they have two primary types of options that we generally use in the market. And one of them is a call option. And a call option gives you, gives you the right to buy 100 shares of an underlying asset at a specific price for a certain period of time. So for example, if everybody knows what Disney is there, everybody knows Disney, right? So <clears throat> Disney, so let's say I buy a, what we would call a $90 strike put option on Disney that expires on July 17th. And if that's the case, if you bought that option, you would have the right to buy Disney for $90 until July 17th, regardless of the asset, regardless of what the price of Disney is. So I buy, it, I buy a $90 call option and it's good for say 30 days and I can buy Disney for $90 in 30 days. Meaning if Disney goes up to $150, I can still buy it for $90, okay? And in order to do that, I pay a time premium for that. In other words, I pay a, value, a, a specific value for that and that value goes away. So if Disney obviously goes to $150 and I can buy it for 90, then uh, two things happen. Number one, that option's worth a lot of money to somebody else because you can sell it. I mean, if, if, I, I, if, you, if I sold you something, if Disney was at $150 and I had an option to buy it for 90, I could sell you that option. That'd be valuable to you. Um, and the, the other thing I could do is I could exercise it and I could buy the stock. Okay. That's essentially how a call option works. A put option is the opposite. The put option, if I bought a put option on Disney, say I bought the same, uh, a $90 strike put option that expired in 30 days, that gives me the right to sell you Disney at $90. Meaning if Disney goes down to $5, I can still sell it to you for ninety dollars. That gives that gives the value that gives it value. Of course, if the price goes the other way, then the option's worthless, and it's not worth anything to anybody. Does that make sense? Cool. Sort of. <laughs> um, as far as as far as bid ask prices, you know, ask price is what would would would, would what is what we would call a sticker price. So if I was gonna buy a used car and there was a price on the windshield, that's the asking price for the car. And that is going to be the price that the uh, seller of the car is willing to sell the car for. Um, if I talk about a bid price, a bid price is what I would be offering for the car. So the car might be $10,000 ask price and I might say, I'm willing to pay you $9,000 for it, right? So my bid's $9,000, the ask is $10,000. It's the same thing with a stock. A stocks have bid ask prices. I think they cover that up in Forex, right? They don't have a bid ask price. They, they just give you a single price. But in, if you buy stocks in the US market, they have a bid and an ask. They're usually fairly close together. Options bid ask prices tend to be spread kind of wide. So, um, but that's essentially what it is. Okay, and you, you, you offer the bid, you pay and ask, and usually you can buy the asset somewhere in the middle, just like if you were negotiating a price on anything else. All right, so maybe you can, from the trading experience, you can tell us why fear and greed represents the mass psychology of markets, no matter the asset instruments that one is trading. So be it currencies, be it options, be it commodity trading, be it U.S. equities, because we have U.S. equities on, on, trade, on this trading platform with Scope Market. So how do you manage fear and greed to just make sound decision-making processes? Okay, so you, so you want to talk about fear and greed in the marketplace first? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the marketable price of an asset, such as a stock or a currency, is determined by the balance between how much traders are willing to pay for it versus how much traders are willing to sell it for. So if that's the case, then we need to determine what people will buy, what, what determines, we need to ask, what determines what people will buy stuff for and what people will sell it for. 
So in coaching, we have this thing called the motivational triad. And basically what that represents are the motivational factors that drive all human being behavior. And those factors are the, uh, the tendency to avoid pain, the tendency to seek pleasure, and to conserve energy. And by the way, these three tendencies are why most people find themselves unconsciously searching for the holy grail or the magic trading strategy or the magic indicator where they can make money without having to do an overabundance of work or have to risk being wrong. And they'll chase these things even though they intellectually know that such a thing doesn't exist. Okay, so that is the reason that people unconsciously do that. Now, to get back to fear and greed itself, in modern society, the prospect of making a lot of money is associated with intense pleasure, and the uh, prospect of losing money is associated with intense pain. This being the case, when traders see an asset going up, they'll typically associate that um, with the asset continuing to go up because of what we call recency bias. And that being the case, they see an opportunity to make money or they get greedy and they feel compelled to enter the position or if they're in the position, they feel compelled to stay in the position. Um, you can call this greed, you can call this fear of missing out, but either way, the emotion prompts people to react to it. And when that happens, that's gonna drive the prices much higher than they should be and, over, and create a market that's too expensive. On the flip side of that, once the asset price starts to drop, the pain of loss is starting to be felt by people and they get scared and they, uh, and at that point, our natural tendency is to avoid the pain. People panic out of the positions and that drives prices much lower than they should be. And that being the case, that essentially means that the market is an emotional machine. The prices of the market are derived from the group emotions of the trader. Now, of course, all the big banks all the institutions that, uh, that have a lot of money in the market, they know all this. And they have an uncanny ability of knowing where the pain and pleasure points are for most traders. This being the case, what they'll do is they'll push the markets just far enough to trigger the points where traders start to act irrationally. Um, it, it, you know, if you've ever been in the, you know, if you've been trading for a while, you'll notice that there's times when it feels like someone's watching you when you're trading. You know, you're literally, you'll make a trade and the next thing you know, it goes the other way. Is somebody watching you? No, right. <laughs> nobody's watching you specifically, but what they are doing is they're watching the way the vast majority of retail traders are acting. And human beings act the same when they become emotional. They have this herd mentality and they're taking advantage of that. Therefore, if you are trading like the vast majority of people, then that's why it feels like you're being watched. <laughs> because specifically you're not, but you know, you're just it just tells you you're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. And a lot of people don't make money in the marketplace. So you don't necessarily want to be doing that. You know, as how as far as how to manage fear and greed in order to make good decisions, well, that's what we're gonna be talking about a little bit in the presentation. So we can go into right. that there. I think now you can go ahead and start your presentation, John. Okay, great, let me, let, let me put that up there. Let's just quickly hop into this. What I like to talk about before we even talk about um, the decision-making itself is I ask the question, what is the most important skill in trading? Is it having a trading strategy? Is it back testing? Is it position sizing or charting or indicators? Is it knowing everything there is to know about the marketplace? And the answer to that is no. The most important thing to, or the most important skill to have is the ability to make great risk reward decisions. Now, Realize that we decide what trading strategies to use, we decide when to use them, we decide when a strategy is no longer viable and when to increase or decrease our position sizes. We decide every aspect of the way we trade. Those are all developed in good decision, in deci with decisions. Therefore, regardless of what you're trading and regardless of what style you're trading, it's critically important that you have developed this ability to make really good decisions. 
So what does it take to make good decisions? Well, first of all, it's going to take a what we call a neutral to somewhat abundant mindset. So if we were to take a scale of one to 10, we want like a four to eight on that scale. And we'll talk about how to achieve that as we move on a little bit. But that's one of the things that we want to be. We don't want to be, so we certainly don't want to, we certainly do not want a mindset of scarcity where we're, we feel that we need to make money or that the result of this trade is a really big deal. And we don't want the mindset of total abundance like nothing matters. Because if nothing matters, you're not going to have any emotion behind your trading and you're not going to trade well without emotion. And that's something when I say that people kind of get a little surprised. They say, well, wait a minute, you know, am, am, isn't the point trying to control my emotions? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, we have to realize that our, emotion, our emotions drive all our actions. Therefore, if we want to take the proper actions, we do have to have the emotion behind that. But the thing is, we have to make sure we have the proper emotion behind it, because the wrong emotions will tend will cause you to do the wrong things, and the right emotions will cause you to do the right things. So we want to be aware of what those are, and make sure that we're in the zone, so to speak, that we're making good decisions. Second is you want a detached awareness of your self-talk and your thoughts. The thing that makes us human beings is the fact that we can monitor and think about our own thoughts. No other animal in the world can do that. That is what makes us human. That's what gives us the advantage that we have or, uh, in, in, you know, compared to all other mammals. So um, use it. We have the ability to disassociate from ourselves and, under, and notice what we're thinking and uh, notice our thoughts and then to question those thoughts and to change those thoughts. So that's gonna be a critical part of making a great decision. Um, also, it's gonna take knowledge about and experience in the subject. Now we said earlier that the, a trading strategy isn't the most important thing, but it is, an, it is an important thing and we need to understand or have a certain amount of knowledge in order to, uh, in order to make a good decision on the subject that we're trying to, to decide on. Now, that being the case, the amount of information you need to be an exceptionally good trader is actually quite small. So um, keep that in mind. And the other thing it takes is just lots and lots of practice of making decisions and, uh, and stuff like that. So let's kind of move on here. Most bad decisions in trading uh, are the result of fear and uncertainty. Realize that uncertainty, the fear of uncertainty, okay? So in other words, a lot of people aren't necessarily afraid to lose the amount of money that they're going to lose. And, but rather they put a meaning, some sort of a meaning behind that loss. And the meaning is often a lot worse. I mean, unless somebody's trading irresponsibly, the meaning they're putting around the loss, they're wrapping around the loss, they, they, they wrap a, a meaning around that says, you know, if I lose this trade, that means I'm never gonna be a good trader. And if I'm not a good trader, or, or if I'm not a good trader, then, um, you know, what does that mean? That means I won't be accepted, or I won't be loved, or I'm not good enough. And if I'm not good enough, you know, this, this whole thought pattern leads down a a trail that's going to lead you essentially to death. Okay, so what a lot of people, what a lot of people don't do when they're trading is they don't clearly define what that loss is and what that loss means. And one of the things about the unconscious mind is if it doesn't understand the extent of the problem, it freaks out. It goes into what we call full fear mode. So. Uh, one of the things that we do is we do a thought download. And, you know, when we start feeling fear, we start feeling this emotion. And we write down everything that our brain is thinking. And we follow that thought process to the very end. So, in other words, if I say that, um, you know, I'm afraid, you know, I'm right down, I'm afraid that uh, I'm going to lose money or I'm going to lose the trade. Why? Why am I afraid? What does that mean? I write down, well, it means that I'm, you know, I'm a loser or, or whatever. 
And that's just drama, first of all. But anyway, but it means I'm a loser. So if, you lose, so if you're a loser, what does that mean? Well, it means my wife isn't going to love me. And, um, you know, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be alone and nobody's going to want me. Okay, so if nobody wants you, what does that mean? And like I said, it always goes down to death. That's what your unconscious mind is thinking. It's thinking that your survival is little, literally at stake in this single trade. And when it thinks that, there is no way you're going to control the fear. I mean, if, you, if, if, you're, if your unconscious mind thinks you're going to die if you lose this trade, it's going to be freaking out. And it's going to, be, it's going to make you do anything to try to get away from the pain. And that's going to make, create these irrational decisions. So um, realize that, you know, it'll, and again, that's the fear of uncertainty. And uncertainty in itself is an emotion also. So um, anyway, realize that we create our emotions through our thoughts and what we happen to focus on. So for example, if we lose a trade and we focus on the loss and how bad it is, and we think that if we lose this trade, it's going to be this terrible, awful thing, then we're going to be afraid of it. If we lose the trade and we think that losing the trade is, is, is no big deal, it's no, you know, say I'm going to lose $500 on a trade, you know, that in the United States, I, if I take my family out to dinner, it's going to cost me at a nice restaurant, it's going to cost me $500. And I would be willing to do that. So the loss of the $500 doesn't really mean anything to me from a financial standpoint. I mean, I have a little bit, so I have less money in my account. But if, if I focus on it that way, then I no longer, I don't have that fear associated with the loss anymore. Okay, the fear goes away. Um, realize that we can always find evidence to, to justify any emotion. One of the things we do as human beings is we, to, in order to make sense of the world, we delete, we distort, and we generalize information. And meaning that a lot of the information that we're actually looking at is something that's biased towards whatever we happen to be focusing on. And again, that creates a situation where your focus is extremely, extremely important. So when we talk about trading, we have to ask what is the most beneficial emotion when we trade? Um, the most beneficial emotion is to have some sort of um, certainty and a mildly optimistic outlook that that certainty is going to go through. Now, one of the things that we need to realize is that we talked about certainty being an emotion and we have control over whether or not we, how we feel about certain things. So I'm going to tell you a fact about something. Any one of us here could die at any moment. Anyone could die at any moment. We all, uh, you know, we all, we all have a death sentence. We're all going to die. But most of us go through life day to day, choosing to ignore the fact that we are going to die and we're going to, and we could die at any moment. Instead, we, we replace that, with a belief that I'm going to live today. We're essentially, we're developing a sense of certainty through believing that we will live each day, even though we have no way of knowing that's true. The reason we don't pay attention to the fact that we could die at any moment is because what would happen if we constantly thought about the fact that we might die at any moment? We wouldn't be able to do anything. We wouldn't be able to do anything. So my point being, the f ignoring the fact, choosing to ignore it, believing to ignore the fact that we could die at any moment, that allows us to function very well in life and it allows us to make our life better. So when we look at trading, the consequences of losing a trade is just, I mean, it's losing money. It's, it's nothing like dying. <laughs> right? It's nothing like dying. So we can change our beliefs around that and we can go ahead and feel different, choose to feel differently about it. So when I talk about this, when I talk about to people about, well, you can just simply choose to believe something different, to think something different. They say, well, I understand that. And, but 
right? But, but this, but that. They have a story behind it of why they don't want to do that. Um, I would like everybody on the webinar here to realize just because something is factual doesn't mean it's beneficial to focus on it. Just from our ex example. It's also not beneficial, beneficial to believe necessarily what we're conditioned to believe about it. So one of the reasons for herd mentality in trading is because we all believe the same thing. Or we don't all believe it, but a vast majority of us believe the same things. And that cr means we take the same behaviors. And of course, the market knows what those are, that is, and they take advantage of that. But realize that we have thoughts and beliefs about facts or circumstances, which lead to certain emotions that alter our perceptual filters in a way where we will seek out evidence to perpetuate that emotion until we have enough evidence to logically conclude that our belief was correct and we can act upon it. Right. Another, um, yes. Sorry, um, I had to pause you for a little bit. Sure. Um, just to see if we can have some reaction from my co-host. Certainly, yeah. So we can, we can have some questions and answers and I don't have to get yeah. through this. Whatever's most beneficial for you guys. Oh, okay, cool. Um, for now, I just think that you can, you can still proceed mm -hmm. with the presentation. Yeah, there's still a question. Okay, fantastic. Okay, just let me know and we'll do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But my point being is the way human beings work is there is a fact. And when we talk about a fact, a fact is something that everybody would agree on. So we have a fact and then we have a thought about that fact. The thought about that fact is going to lead to some sort of an emotion that emotion is going to prompt us to either take action or not take action. And then we're going to get a result from taking those actions. What you're going to find out through coaching people and what I found out through coaching hundreds and thousands of people is that the result always goes back to the thought. So the result proves the thought. And that's what this statement essentially means. So if you have this belief that you're, you know, um, that losing the trade is a disaster and you're going to lose the trade. You're going to have certain feelings and emotions. Those emotions are going to prompt actions that are going to tend to lead towards the loss of that trade and that loss being a problem for you. And the result is going to prove that thought again. And the way to get, out, and that's a, that's a vicious cycle. And the way to get out of that is to change it at the thought level. Your result will always prove your thought to the extent that the result is under your control. So again, if you're afraid of losing money, your emotional, your emotions will cause a perceptual shift in a way that's going to filter information that is going to create a logical story that will prompt you to take action or every action within your control to realize that loss. Now in trading, we don't always have, con we don't have control over what the market does and we don't necessarily have control over we win or lose, which goes back to, um, which goes back to um, um, evaluating your decisions. See, uh, but that's a different topic. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put the table that for now. We can talk about that later if you want in questions and answers, but you'll do every, everything in your control to lose that trade if that's your fear. All right, so moving on here, we wanna talk about facts versus drama. In order, to, in order to make great decisions, we must separate circumstances or true facts from thoughts, applied meanings, and or opinions. So let's just take these two statements. The market is going down. Is that a fact? No. no. That, is, that is an opinion. The fact is, like if we're trading the SPX, for example, the fact is the, the SPX was at 28.50 at 9.30, and it's now at 28.30. But that tells us nothing about where it's going. The fact is we don't know where it's going. The fact is, the only fact is that, is that it's at a certain asset price. When you get into this thing where you think the market is going down, or you tell yourself a statement like the market's going down, your mind thinks, thinks the market's going to continue to go down. It biases your decision because now it thinks that the market going down is a fact, but that's not the case, right? So 
And once it biases your decision, you collect evidence to confirm that decision. The way the decision, the, the way the human mind works is when you believe something is a fact, it filters out information that is contrary to that. And it brings in information or seeks out information that, that, that reinforces the fact. By realizing it's not a fact, but, a, but rather an opinion is the first step in releasing yourself from that bias. So here's another thing, you know, I lost money versus I have $5,000 less in my account. I lost money is drama. It's not defined. You may have less money now than you did when you entered the trade, but you didn't lose the money. If you look at it as if I lost the money, think of loss in the emotion that that brings you and think of have just having 500 less dollars in your account and the emotion that brings you. There's two very different emotions that those thoughts will, that those thoughts will trigger. Now, you know, there's many reasons I might have $500 less in my account. Again, maybe I went out and bought myself uh, a present. Maybe I bought somebody, you know, my, my wife a present or whatever, or I bought a, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I bought, I bought something I wanted. That's a reason to have $500 less in your account. There's no, drama to that necessarily until you until you add the opinion that I lost the money. See that you see the difference there? There's a very big difference with that. So realize the meaning you put on events events will determine the quality of your decisions. The meaning determines how you think, therefore how you feel about the event. A thought or how you think about that is always, always a choice. Now, you will have automatic thoughts come in. So something happens and you'll automatically have a thought about it. And that's because the way you think about things is a habit. And just like any other habit, a habit works off a trigger, it runs a pattern, and it expects a reward after the, tr after the patterns run. So, your thoughts are the same way. You've learned to unconsciously think a certain way about certain things, but realize that when they pop up, and this goes back to what we said initially of being detached from your thoughts, allowing yourself to step back and watch your thoughts. When, the, when thoughts pop up that are going to lead to emotions that are not going to be beneficial to you in trading, you need to be able to identify that thought and replace it with something else, okay? Because that's going to determine what you believe and over time, the thought process that you have will change. So you need to think about what is the result that I want? How do I feel right now? And ask yourself the question, is this an emotion that's going to be beneficial for, for producing the, the desired result? Okay, so in other words, you know, I'm in a trade and my result is I want to either, you know, maybe control this loss or I want to win the trade. I think about how I feel right now. If I'm feeling stressed out and afraid and things like that, then I have to, then I can write that down and say, okay, I feel stressed out. I feel afraid. And I need to ask myself, is this the emotion that is going to be the most beneficial for me to produce the result, the desired result? And the answer is if you're afraid, then in trading, no, it's going to cause you to create irrational decisions. So since this isn't the emotion that I need, you need to ask yourself what emotion would be best best beneficial for me personally in this situation. And then once you understand what emotion you're going after, then you can figure out a thought that you can believe that is going to produce the desired emotion. Now, when most people do this, they, they, know, the, they know a thought that if they believed it would create that emotion, but they don't believe the thought. So we have to start 
doing what we call bridge thoughts and start thinking thoughts we can believe that will escalate the emotion down. Okay. But that's basically how that works. Um, realize that all the power in your life that you have is in your power to make decisions. So in order to make good decisions, we must identify the difference between facts and opinions. Facts are something that everyone would agree on, right? If you asked everybody in the world, they would be the same thing. And, and what you'll find out is there are very few things that are actually facts. Most pe what people think are facts are they're actually their opinions. Um, and then you need to choose the opinions that are gonna benefit you. That's, that's essentially how you're going to um, go forward. All right, did you wanna stop and do questions and answers or do you want to continue on? I mean, I can talk all day, so. <laughs> Just continue, John. Yeah, okay. Really fantastic, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So let's talk about some enemies of good decision-making. So there's this thing we call narrow framing and that is the tendency to focus in on one or two options while filtering out many viable, potentially much more useful options. So when we get into the emotion of fear or when the human being becomes fearful, what happens is they, they have this thing called a narrowing focus of attention. So I don't know if anybody's ever been in say a car accident or been held at knife point or anything like that. Um, I used to train martial artists, so we, we were held at knife point a lot. But what happens is when you become afraid is, you know, say it's, um, say it's a car and you're going towards a tree. What tends to happen is you'll focus towards a tree, you'll, you'll focus on the tree and that tree will become so big that there's no way around it. And therefore you have no choice but to hit the tree, right? That's the narrowing focus and that's what fear brings. So that is gonna be an enemy of good decision-making because you can't see all the options that are available to you at that point. You see there's only, you, 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 you convince yourself there's only one option. And then of course that option is to usually make an irrational trading decision. Um, the other thing is uh, another enemy of good decision-making is what we call confirmation bias. Um, And the question I ask is, what does your mind want more than absolutely anything in the world? Your mind wants to be right. It doesn't matter if it's factual, it doesn't matter if it's an opinion, it doesn't matter what it is. Your mind wants to be right. It, it seeks evidence to prove that it's right. It ignores evidence that proves the contrary. So it's very normal to develop, uh, it's a very normal habit to, to quickly develop a belief about something and then seek out, delete, distort, and generalize information in a way that proves the belief. We don't want that to happen, okay? Because all that does is make things worse. We'll talk about how to fight these in a minute. Um, the other thing is short-term stresses and emotions. The unconscious mind or the part of you that controls your habits and your instantaneous actions it's focusing in on instant pleasure, instant pleasure and the relief of stress or the relief of pain at the expense of long-term goals. This is why when we're on a diet and we're trying to lose weight and we see a piece of cake in front of us or whatever it is that we like, we know intellectually that in order to reach our goal of becoming a certain weight that we shouldn't be eating cake. But our unconscious wants that instant pleasure. It wants the relief of any stresses that it has and it sees that cake as that. So unconsciously, you're gonna go in, you're gonna grab the cake before you even know it and you're gonna be, you know, before you know it, it's gone and you're on your third piece of cake. So, <laughs> so that is a clear, that was a poor decision. Would you, you know, would you agree? Sure. <laughs> right, that's a poor decision. It's the, same, it's the same process with trading. It's the exact same process. You're, you're, you're giving up your long-term your long-term goals in order to relieve the stress or get a little bit of pleasure right now. And we have to go back and be able to realize that that's what the brain does, right? You're, you're naturally, you're gonna have that urge. You're gonna wanna do that in order to relieve the stress but it comes in detaching yourself from that, interrupting that, and then focusing on the long-term pleasure. 
so that the so that you can make the right decision. Um, the other thing is overconfidence. One of the things with trading, well, one of the things in general is we crave certainty. And the more we're in what we call a scarcity mindset, the more afraid we are, the more certainty that we, that we, we crave. Now, one of the things that traders do is we create certainty through systematically creating evidence that certain events have a much higher likelihood of happening than they really do often more than it's possible. So uh, I don't know if you guys do back trading, but a lot of us here in the United States, we do back trading. In other words, we go back and we take data from the past and we try trading strategies that uh, to see how they work out. Now, a lot of people in back testing, the reason they, they, they back test is because they want some sort of certainty that the strategy is going to work out so that they feel confident enough to trade it. What happens when they do this back testing, though, is they unconsciously bias all the past events so that they work out in their favor. In other words, they'll, they'll what we call tweak that strategy until it works perfectly based on past evidence. And in that process, what they're doing is they're, they just happen to be making all the right decisions at all the right times in the past. And when they take that SIF strategy and they try to bring it into the future, all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. That's because they're, but, but the, the, the dangerous part about that is they've created overconfidence in something because they've manipulated it in a way where they could prove to themselves that this was a functioning strategy. That allows them to go into the market and be overconfident and since they're overconfident about what, over, more confident than they should be about what's gonna happen in the future in the marketplace, they're going to make poor decisions. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, it does. So uh, again, stop me at any time, but yeah. I, will, I will move on if, uh, if uh, we have nothing else. So um, narrow framing, fighting narrow framing. Stress naturally creates a narrowing focus of attention. So what we need to do is purposely, purposefully widen our focus of attention. And we do this by having the proper body posture. Um, that is the fastest way to change anybody's state. So one of the things that we should think about when we, when we talk, think about being human, the emotion of stress has a certain body posture. When people get stressed, they tend to lean forward, okay? They will breathe very shallow. They'll breathe in the upper part of their stomach. And that's how, you know, it, when we start talking about NLP, if I'm working with a client <clears throat> through like hypnotherapy or something, we can tell they're stressed simply by their emotion. So your emotion creates a certain posture in your body. What a lot of people don't understand is a certain posture in your body also creates an emotion. In other words, it works backwards. So if we're stressed and we bring our shoulders back and we bring our head up and we breathe in deeply in our stomach, and in other words, we hold the body posture of somebody who feels confident, that automatically reverses what's going on in the mind that automatically creates a different emotion. And you can try it right now. You can bring in, you can sit up straight, you can bring your shoulders back. Do you feel a difference? Yeah. Right. That, yeah. that, right. That brings that, that automatically brings out different chemicals in your body that automatically changes your perceptual filters and has, it allows you to widen your area of focus. Okay. So that brings you out. So it's, it's basically breaking state through body posture. Um, when, when stressed, we can practice relaxation techniques as well. Um, you can practice. You can practice asking yourself alternative questions. So, when we um, when we're stressed out and we start narrow framing, we can say and we and we can identify with that and we can bring ourselves out. We can we can start asking ourselves questions like, is there another way or a better way to accomplish this? We can start bringing in other options and and, and, and narrow our focus out. And when we do that, I would say always bring out at least two other options. You don't want to bring out too many options. Too many options creates overwhelm. 
right? So if I, in other words, if I say, what's another choice I have, and I, and I have a choice of five or six options, that's generally as many as you want. You want more than two, but less than seven. And um, that allows you to make a decision. You get more, to, more than seven, you start to become overwhelmed, and that in itself creates stress again. So um, anyway, widen our decisions uh, when we have narrow framing. Um, and we want to make sure we create and practice multiple options for any situation that we can think of. All right. Now, when we um, talk about me, go ahead. Uh, yeah, kindly allow me to interject um, with a question. Sure. When someone is trading, um, what causes that narrow focus? What are those things that cause that fear, which makes someone, which makes someone have that narrow focus? Okay, so, right, so you, you, well, let's talk about the context of when you're in a trade. So you're in a trade and um, it looks like it's going against you, okay? So in other words, if, if, if you're in a trade and the, and the market's behaving pretty much normally, normally that's not a big deal, right? Everything's going well. Now, two things will cause a narrowing of focus. First, uh, first of it would be if the trade starts, or if you perceive that the trade starts going against you. So say you know you're up a thousand dollars in your trade, and now you see the thousand dollars go to nine hundred dollars, and then to eight hundred dollars. Right? You see the trades going against you, and then you perceive that as losing money. So I perceive this as losing money, and then a fear comes in. You know, what if I lose this trade, and and that releases certain chemicals in your body that leads to what we call a fear response. And that is going to automatically narrow your focus. Does that make sense? Totally. The same thing can happen in the other direction where you see the markets going up and you get over excited. Your emotional arousal becomes too high. In other words, you're thinking that, oh, look, this trade's going to make $10,000. You know, I'm going to stay in this trade. And again, that narrows your focus to focusing on this trade, having to make $10,000. And at that point, again, you're starting to narrow your focus of attention. So any, any, when we, when we exceed a certain threshold of emotional arousal, that narrows your focus down. Okay, cool. The key, the key is to realize that's happening and then deal with it. <laughs> okay. Thank All you right. for the response. Thank you for oh, your you're, response. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so, so when we start talking about confirmation bias, it's important to understand, it's important to realize that when you're having some sort of a confirmation bias. And what I like to do is I like to force myself to build a case for the opposite story. So in other words, whenever I, whenever I am, I find myself having the opinion that this has to happen, right? We know the market is unpredictable as far as pricing. We don't know. Nobody knows where the price is going to go. We have ideas. We have probabilities. We have things like that. But as soon as I get to the point where I, where I convince myself that the price is going up or I convince myself that the price is going down, then I know I have some sort of a bias going on. And that being the case, what I do is I force myself to make a case for the opposite story. story. So, so say I, I, I'm convinced the price is going up. I ask myself, if I was convinced the opposite, if I was convinced the price is going down, what evidence can I find that the price is going down? I'm poking holes in my story, right? I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm bringing the opposite, the opposite viewpoint into consideration. And in doing that, once I do that, now I have two stories. I don't just have my positive story, I also have my negative story. And then I can take and weigh both sides of that, and then I can come up with probability estimates. So one of the things you never want to tell yourself is I know the market's going up or I know the market's going down. What you want to tell yourself is I believe that there's a 60% chance of the market might go higher and maybe a 40% chance that it might go lower. Okay, this brings in the it brings to your conscious awareness and to your unconscious awareness that you don't know what's going to happen, that you don't know what's going to happen. And because believing again, confirmation bias is, is, is a real problem. So we want to make sure we do that. So 
you know, I might make a statement, the market's going down. Uh, just let me read the statement. The market is going down has a very different feel and it will produce a very different decision then the SPX has a 70% chance of hitting this level and a 30% chance of going the other way and hitting another level. Do you see the difference in that statement, in those two statements? Okay, that is gonna produce a very different emotion and a very different decision. When we start talking about short-term stresses and short-term emotions, um, you wanna think about th three things and there's this thing we call 10-10-10. How will this decision feel in 10 minutes? How will this decision feel in 10, 10, 10 days? How will it feel in 10 months? Okay, so when I'm thinking about eating my piece of cake, I think about, well, what's my actual goal? If I eat this cake, how am I gonna feel in 10 minutes? I'm probably gonna feel like I want more cake. <laughs> how am I gonna feel about that in 10 days? I'm probably gonna be pretty upset I ate the cake because in 10 days I'm actually heavier than I was so many days ago, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if I keep this, if I keep this up for 10 years or 10 months, what's that going to look like? Okay. So, so, you know, I, I, I realize I'm, sh I have this short-term stress because I have an urge to do something, mm -hmm. right? You know, you have a short-term stress when you have an urge to do something. If I, if I, if I take this urge, how's this going to feel in 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years? <clears throat> it's a, it allows you to look at your decision in different time frames, and that a lot of times will bring down the stress or cause you to make a more beneficial decision. And um, when we're doing this, um, beware of loss aversion and exposure bias. Understand that the human animal finds losses much more painful than wins, than it finds mm -hmm. wins pleasant. So, in other words, if I am looking at the prospect of losing $100 versus the prospect of making $100, I'm going to do more to avoid losing the $100 than I am to make the $100. And if you're trying to make money in trading, that can be quite challenging. So you need to be mindful of that and make sure that you um, take that into consideration with your biases because that causes a bias immediately, right? Because now you're, you're, when you start thinking about making a decision trading, you're biased more towards not losing money than you are towards making money. In which case, if that becomes your focus, then uh, yes, of course, we need to have loss limits, but we can't be focused on that loss. Otherwise, through the thought process we talked about earlier, the focus on the loss or losing or the thought of that is gonna create feelings that aren't gonna be beneficial to you. So um, you wanna do that. And um, the other thing you wanna do is you wanna ask, what would I tell my best friend in this situation? So we can step back about this. You know, so you're thinking about making a trading decision and it's very important to just step back before you do that and say, well, if my friend was in this same situation, what would I tell him? A lot of times that would, that leads you to a lot better decision because you don't, you don't have the emotional attachment at that point, okay? And that's okay. how you would fight those four enemies. So that's pretty much what I have. Um, you know, we can go more, but I know we're, we're, uh, we're at time here. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, John, um, for that presentation. Um, you know, in, um, when it comes to trading effects, trading currencies, uh, especially in the retail space, uh, very few traders pay attention to the psychological aspect of uh, of the business and um, I, I really really appreciate uh, what you've put up and also what is in your website and um, I only have uh, one question sure. and uh, trust me this is very new to many uh, guys usually focus on the next fancy indicator the next uh, <laughs> yeah yeah the next come, fancy yeah <laughs> come, come, come to our website and get the seven secrets to becoming a successful trader it talks all about that <laughs> Exactly. You know, guys focus on that, the next fancy indicator, the next ATM machine-like strategy, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my, my question is, um, what, how, how does uh, neuro-linguistic programming help in uh, refining someone's thought process so that you can be able to fight these enemies by being um, self-aware? Well, the cool thing about NLP is 
Uh, John, uh, um, before you proceed, I would also, yeah. you know, maybe you can define what NLP is to the members of the audience, what it entails, and then you can proceed to um, tell us how it helps um, manage the thought, uh, thought processes. Okay, so NLP is essentially a tool and it's, it covers a wide range of different techniques. And um, it was developed by Richard Bandler and John Grindler back in the late 60s. And they, they developed it through, um, through working with essentially psychiatric patients um, and get, trying to get them to, to function normally. So they would take somebody who couldn't function in life and get them to function normally. And, this is, and they'd be able to do it in like a period of like 10 minutes to three or four hours. And these are people who have been in the psychiatric wards for 10, 20, 30 years, and they can go in and they could, and they could shift things around and actually make them functional as human beings, which is really quite amazing. Now, uh, what they discovered when they were doing this is that the mind encodes things in a certain way. And also it takes language a certain way. So when we talk to somebody, uh, consciously we hear one thing and unconsciously we hear something else. And this is why I talked about when you, when you don't give your unconscious a very defined limit on what your loss means to you, it goes, it goes into freak out mode. So, and, and, and it's all those concepts. So essentially NLP, it deals with the way the mind codes and stores information and makes meaning of the world. And, you know, it does this, like I said, through language and it does this, uh, based on what we call submodalities. In other words, if you are afraid of something, it places it in one place in your mind. If, you're, if you like something or you're confident about something, it's placed in another area in your mind. It has different submodalities. It might have different colors. It might have different sounds. It might have different you know, uh, locations. So this being the case with NLP, we can use that as a tool. So if you're, if you're, if you're in a situation where you say this loss means that um, you know something disastrous. In other words, you're having an emotional trigger. What we want to do is we want to figure out what's causing that emotional trigger and how you're organizing your experience. And then from there, we can take that. You know, what we talked about today, we talked about having a different thought about it. Okay, well, some people can't have a different thought about it, or they, they can have a different thought about it, but they feel like they can't have a different thought about it. And when they're having that challenge, we can use the, the tools in NLP, we can use the tools in NLP to John? instantly change what they think. NLP we use as a tool. And I was saying, if, you have, if a trader has something or a situation where, uh, like we were talking about before, I say you need to feel differently in order to make the right decisions as a trader, right? But there, let's say, and, and, and I say in order to feel differently, you have to, have to think about it differently. Let's say the trader can't believe a different thought or has trouble believing a different thought or thinking about something differently. I can come in and use the tools of NLP to shift that belief. So NLP, what it does is, is it's, well, first of all, it, it's, it's a model for how a human being codes their experience and codes their meanings and codes things in their mind. In other words, how they make sense of the world. And what we can, what you'll notice is that if you have something that you're really excited about or happy about it, if you make a picture of that, it exists in a certain location. If you have a feeling about that, that feeling exists in a certain location and it, and it has certain submodalities, it has a certain size, it has a certain intensity, it has a certain color. And, you know, and, and that's the way your mind knows whether something's good or not, or whether something should be fearful or not. And we can, and we can talk to you and understand where you place these items in your mind and then we can use that information to move things around so that things have different meanings to you. It's really, really quite fascinating. Um, and we can do that extremely, extremely quickly. And I don't know if you, if you dropped out before I was talking about psych, uh, the development of NLP, but um, it, it was initially developed through Richard Bandler and John Grindler, and they used it 
or they where they experimented in how the mind works in psychiatric wards. They'd have people who had been in psychiatric wards for 10, 15, 20 years, most of their whole life, and they'd go in there, and in a period of, say, 10 minutes to a week, they'd have this person functioning normally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an incredible feat, and, it, and they did that through, you know, understanding how the person coded their, coded their meaning of the world, and then changing that coding. And we do the same thing here, only we're, we're, we're taking it from somebody who's relatively normal, and we're, and we're, and we code them so that they can perform at a peak level. All right, John, thank you so much for that presentation. I think for now, because we have already addressed the Q&A session, um, mm -hmm. you can maybe conclude by telling us who your trading mentor or idol is, and then gratitude to the Scope Markets audience and any book recommendations you may have on human behavior and high peak performance for retail and institutional traders? Uh, let's see, a trading idol. I would say this is guy that I met early on in my trading career. His name is Jeff Kohler. Mm -hmm. And he actually has a trading service now, which I don't, I, I, I would highly discourage anybody from doing a trading service. Doing a trading service and following somebody else, you don't learn anything. Okay, all you're doing is you're following along and you're building false confidence. And I also like to point out that a lot of these trading services actually lose money. They just make money through people following their trading service. Um, in other words, it doesn't necessarily mean these people are making money. But anyway, um, but the bigger part of that is you're not learning. But this guy, Jeff Kohler, he was, he thought about trading differently. And he's one of the people who, uh, and, he's, and he's very successful in trading. And he's one of the people who showed me basically how to think out of the box and how to think differently about trading rather than following the crowd and looking for the next perfect indicator. Yeah, yeah. sure. Maybe now is the book recommendations that people oh. can start with on human behavior and high performance peak um, trading. Yeah, so I like to, one of the books I really like with trading is uh, a book called Thinking in Bets. It's, ma it's making smarter decisions when you don't, making smarter decisions when you don't have all the facts. It's by Annie Duke. She is a professional poker player. And um, it's just, it's a fantastic book on evaluating decisions in the moment. Because, you know, poker pay players, that's what they do. They, they have to make good decisions consistently. Otherwise, they, they lose a lot of money. So it's the same with trading. All right. Thank you so much. We're really grateful and we continue to ask people to open live trading accounts with Scope Markets to apply the principles that John has taught us today. And John, we would love to have you again in the future if yeah. your time allows and much gratitude. And yes, thank you. The words of advice that we can have before we wrap it up. Yes. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad it was helpful. Thanks for everybody for listening. And uh, yeah, so uh, just make a note, if you come to, if you, if you uh, go to um, tradingperformancepodcast.com, we do have a lot of uh, poor past trading performance um, sessions that are, they're, they're like 10 or 15 minutes long. You can quickly watch them about uh, trading performance. And I think that would be helpful for your viewers. So. It's been an honor. So cheers. Goodbye. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thanks, guys, for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.